The following is a program of the Santa Barbara County Education Office. To learn more, visit sbceo.org. Hi, I'm Susan Salcido, Santa Barbara County Superintendent of Schools, and I'm so delighted to introduce to you our guest today, Nancy Weiss, who's the Director of Food Services for the Santa Barbara Unified School District. Nancy, you come with private sector background, public, obviously public school background, and bring so much of your experience into our schools. We're so fortunate to have you with our students each and every day. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much for being here. And we can't, I can't wait to share with the audience about what it is you're doing in Santa Barbara Unified. Um, but I want to first roll back to the beginning. The Nancy Weiss of childhood. <laughs> Tell us where you were born and raised and where you were brought up. Where this came from. Where this came from, exactly. This came from Los Angeles in the San Fernando Valley many years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was born into a very middle-class family. My, my father was an immigrant. He was actually a survivor of the Holocaust. And uh, he met my mother on a beach in Santa Monica. And they were married and had three children. Uh, I'm the youngest and the only girl. So I had a very wonderful, pampering upbringing and uh, found my love for food early on because my mother, um, who's no longer with us, but sorry mama, uh, she was an anti-domestic when you get down to it. She really didn't like the kitchen. She herself was an educator, 40 years in LA Unified, wow. teaching special ed. And uh, food was uh, not her thing. In fact, food, she struggled with food all her life and her weight. And uh, my father, coming from a European background, really had an appreciation for food that um, she couldn't even relate to. But somehow in the genes, I began gravitating more toward the kitchen on those Saturday afternoons when my mother was out shopping. My dad and I were left alone watching uh, John Wayne movies and Tarzan movies and uh, with very little resource in the kitchen I would start cooking uh, for my dad and me and uh, through the years I started uh, helping my mom do parties and holidays became something that I just looked forward to because of the food and it became very obvious and um, that it was one of my gifts. I love that. So obviously your upbringing and that those LA days really have uh, brought, them, brought themselves into your current practice for sure. And before we go into the current practice, let's talk about college for a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, you went to college here at UC Santa Barbara. Yes, I did. So tell us about what you majored in and what you did right after college. Right. So I uh, went to UCSB and uh, had no idea what I was interested in. I knew I liked cooking, but that's not why I went to college. Had I known now what I didn't know then, I should have probably stepped back and given myself a little space to explore uh, different avenues. But instead, I, I jumped right in and uh, focused on the thing that I love next to food, which is communication and reading and writing, so I became an English major and really uh, found that I loved the written word and used it a lot uh, when I graduated because I did uh, a stint with a stock brokerage firm here in Santa Barbara thinking that perhaps I wanted to go into that end of uh, the industry, but instead I was still gravitating toward kitchens and got my first job at the Plaka, which was a Greek restaurant way back when, and um, never looked back. I, I got that job and then I got another job in another kitchen and then landed at Zello, 
where my mentor, Wally Marentette and Bob Stout, who went on to open, uh, or they had already opened the Sojourner, uh, really uh, brought me up in the business and I loved it and in a few years I opened Soho which was my pride and joy and a, a true labor of love um, that I to this day am so proud that my legacy lives on though it was one of the best things I could have done to step away from that business. Mm -hmm. The restaurant industry is brutal and um, at, at that time, I was <clears throat> living um, a dual existence uh, after a while, uh, 13 years after a while. Wow. Um, my parents were older, and my mom had a stroke, unfortunately, and I started spending more and more time back in L.A. and found that I was losing control of the business. Mm -hmm. And so I went into a partnership, and uh, one thing led to another, and I... Uh, separated myself from that partnership and got a small job in a little kitchen in Goleta at Goleta Valley Junior High. I love that. That is wonderful. And <laughs> and so there there we find ourselves now in public education in a kitchen um, at a junior high school, which is mm -hmm. a whole different uh, entity than it, probably a private restaurant. Oh, but yes. I'm sure that the lessons learned from your restaurant days and the les lessons learned from those Saturdays watching John Wayne and making <laughs> something great out of very little. Right. And your English major has made its way into your professional life. So let's go back to Goleta Valley Junior High for a minute. What would a day in the life of a kitchen at one of our public school junior mm -hmm. highs look like? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, that was in the mid-90s, and it looks a lot different today, mm -hmm. thankfully. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I stepped into school food not really knowing anything about it and being uh, that I don't have children myself, um, I was very disconnected from what kids were eating and uh, in general what they were doing. I had stepped out of uh, a world that was all about the restaurant into a completely different culture um, that being of uh, school food, and it was uh, it was a very difficult adjustment, I must say, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is I was very used to being my own boss, and uh, then I found myself in uh, a school cafeteria waiting for bells to ring in order to dictate what I was going to do next. Uh, but most uh, important was the type of food that was being served was uh, uh, something that was really disturbing to me way back then. And uh, my culinary skill, because I am a chef, was um, really put to the test. And again, it was almost that without a lot of resource, taking me back to my Tarzan days, yes. um, I started taking things like um, the breaded chicken patty that had come already pre-made in a box, frozen, and uh, I would do things like lay it out into a casserole and top it with a homemade marinara and call it chicken parmesan. So way back then I was trying to impact the food in a way that was a little more fresh and scratch cooked, although we had nothing uh, to work with at that point except for frozen pre-made food and a turkey roast here and there. So you had some similarities with the, with the restaurant in that you were building some things, um, trying to be creative, but there were major differences as well. Huge. Bells and teenagers. Sure. And, you know, it, and, and people who were working uh, in the cafeterias at that point that were not trained in the profession of, of um, culinary arts. They were uh, very used to box cutters and opening up whatever the entree was of the day and just putting it, they would call it panning up. They would pan up frozen pizza and, you know, stick it in the oven and that was our lunch. Mm -hmm. Or we even had McDonald's and Taco Bell at that time coming in and selling um, to our kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember even then noticing how uh, kids were definitely eating more of the fast food that was coming in than the food that we were offered. And really, there wasn't much of a difference at that point. 
And so you found your way into being a director of food services for Santa Barbara Unified. You were at Goleta Valley for over 10 years, 10 or more uh -huh, years? Yeah, mm -hmm. I was there from 96 to 2007. Mm -hmm. So 11 years. 11 years. And then director of food services, <laughs> and you're directing how many schools now? We're supporting how many schools Well, now? we've got 11 kitchens, mm -hmm. production kitchens. We've got 28 actual locations that we are servicing. But even more than that, because we've added um, summer programs and we've added a federal program called the Supper Program. Mm -hmm. So we have about 13 supper sites on top of the other school sites that we're feeding on a daily basis. So we're mm -hmm. serving lots and lots of meals a day, upward near 8,000, 9,000 meals a day. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. What, it's pretty what a, incredible. It, it is incredible, and we're so fortunate that you are directing that with your wonderful team. Right. And so I can tell from listening to you that things have changed today. I mean, you were talking about the cafeteria of the 90s, and right. you're saying how fortunate it is how things have changed. So what is the change that you're seeing in your uh, kitchens for your students in the district? Well, the, the, in a nutshell, it's the quality of the food and the fact that we're cooking it ourselves. And uh, it was daunting to look at, but then the application itself really rolled out smoothly, and I was surprised at how the staff embraced the new initiative to be cooking from scratch and uh, thanks to the Orfla Foundations and their massive support with their school food initiative uh, that was cresting at the time that I was um, given the position of director and I just recall being super energized with their support because they had what was called the culinary boot camp and uh, most of our staff, including myself, went through a week-long culinary boot camp where we had chef educators teaching our staff how to use a knife and how to use the big machinery and how to do culinary math and uh, how to turn a potato. Uh, those were concepts that were not built into the district's food service program in the 90s and uh, I knew that that needed to happen on behalf of the children and all of the research and all of the increased uh, obesity and diabetes that was facing us square, uh, squarely, we needed to do something about it. So we so started cooking. No more panning. No more panning. Right. It was home scratched or from scratch cooking. Right. Really whole foods and talk about nutrition mm -hmm. and really that you know, supporting these students from the inside out. Absolutely. Yes. So you're super innovative. You have so much energy. You're, you're not only uh, a director of the <laughs> staff of these kitchens, but I understand you also have these food trucks, right. um, mobile cafes. Mobile so cafe. tell us about that, because I know our viewers probably see them here and there, and they want to know, <laughs> can they go up and buy yeah. anything? Where do we find them? Yes, mm -hmm. all over town. Okay. Um, again, the School Food Initiative and, and uh, the Orfla Foundations helped fund the very first truck uh, which was placed at Santa Barbara High School uh, in order to keep kids from leaving uh, because Milpas is right around the corner. We decided to place it at uh, one of our more challenging high schools and uh, it did help with keeping kids on campus. It, uh, it increased our participation. Um, and best of all, it just added a new layer of, of food service that just took everybody by surprise. And the food trucks um, were not even a trend at that point. I think our food truck, uh, I, I think we got it in 2008, right a year into my position, we, we bought our first food truck and haven't looked back. It's really a great program. It, gets our food out into the community. Uh, people are excited uh, when the mobile cafe rolls up and we're at places that are near and dear to me, the Boys and Girls Clubs, um, the Girls Inc., uh, along with a lot of other locations. We're open and a lot of cafeterias are open for the supper program, but that mobile cafe has allowed us to get out in the community for Earth Day and uh, other events that are 
um, community organized so that they can, the, the public can see what we're doing. I must admit, whenever I see the food truck, and I saw you and the food truck at the Earth Day, I look inside to see if I have a Nancy Weiss celebrity sighting, because I want to see you. You're, you're fantastic and such a leader. Um, and one of the ways that you've been recognized as a leader in this community is by being named Woman of the Year by Congressman Salud Carbajal. Tell us what that means to you. What does that mean, to be Woman of the Year? <laughs> It's, it's remarkable to be acknowledged for the work that I do. Um, it, was, it was a surprise, and it was my assistant, uh, Ginger Sandoval, who nominated me for this award. And it was, I'm going to get emotional, but it was so beautiful to see that this woman, who I had asked to come over and be uh, my assistant, um, didn't uh, hesitate to nominate uh, her boss, who can be very demanding, and uh, she, she always laughs, but she's right. I'm very ADD <laughs> or ADHD. Uh, whatever it is, I'm difficult to manage. And that Ginger took the time uh, to nominate me was really, really thoughtful. And uh, when I found out that I was going to be honored with this, I was happy beyond because it really validates everything that I've been working so hard to achieve and uh, it gave me the opportunity to really stand for uh, what it is that I truly believe in and that's whole food and that I was recognized as being a woman of the year uh, because of the work that I do and the service that I do was really uh, a wonderful, wonderful feeling for me. Congratulations <laughs> on that. It's a really outstanding achievement and recognition and obviously, obviously well deserved. Thank so, you, so proud. Susan. Yeah, and let's talk now about education. You know, you really are a teacher. You're really supporting teachers, you're supporting students, but you're a teacher too. Mm -hmm. And you're one of the things I know you're working towards is re educating palates. Right. What people are used to tasting and thinking is good, and, and you're really changing that. Tell us about that. What yes. does that look like? Well, we're, we, um, we are in a position right now where we need to change what is going on with our kids because their palates have been hijacked uh, because of the food uh, engineering that's going on in labs that, unbeknownst to us, all of the ingredients that are being manufactured, uh, for instance, Flaming Hot Cheetos. Uh, Kids are addicted to Flaming Hot Cheetos because of the fat, sugar, and salt. And that's the recipe for most fast food. And that's what is so highly addictive. It actually boosts serotonin levels and makes children crave, over whole food, makes children crave that fat, salt, and sugar. So for me, um, we really need to educate at the earliest possible age and show children what whole food is and how they can eat in order to achieve. And whether they know it now or not, what you eat is what you are. And we've heard that before, you are what you eat. Um, at the, I use eat to live, live to learn, and learn to eat because we really are very disconnected from what we should be doing and what we should be eating. Mm -hmm. So if we don't educate kids when they're young and get their palates back in, in good, healthy, working order, then we're up against a mountain uh, that's, that's full of chemicals and money at the top. Mm -hmm. And it's really a shame that we've gotten to this point, but we are here and now it's a matter of turning it back and getting back to what's really important, which is pure, whole, vital, nourishing meals. And I believe that public education is free, and I believe that meals during the school day should be free and should be woven into the fabric of the campus community. And we're not there yet, but initiatives like breakfast in the classroom and universal eating, breakfast after the bell, 
things that will help support the idea that kids really need to be educated these days. We can no longer just expect this whole massive health crisis to just turn itself around. We know that's not the case. So we need to educate. And as, as educators, we need to construct programs that are going to serve our, our students. And I believe that um, nutrition needs to be taught. And if we could just extend the school day and get those instructional minutes lined up so that meal time could perhaps be instructional time so that teachers have the time to eat with their students at round tables, family style, to make a real difference in the lives of kids whose only good meals may be coming from our school cafeterias. So I think we could do a lot more with what we're doing in terms of educating kids and their teachers so that we're united in this effort, Santa Barbara Unified. I love it. Nancy, you really are. We started with that question by saying you're a, you're a, you're a teacher, and you really are. And um, you're mm -hmm. wanting to educate and re-educate palates. Um, but it's not just about eating for the act of eating or even nourishment inside of a body, which you are very passionate about. But I've heard you talk about the act and community of eating, mm. sitting at the table, you said, family right. style. And I know that that's something when you are out in your kitchens or cafeterias or food trucks, you look out to see how people are enjoying right. their food. Tell us about the significance of that community mm. as part of the nutrition and food services. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. Um, there is a disconnect, again, between the meal itself and what families are doing these days. And it's complicated, um, but it didn't help that now we have all this technology to further distract us from a good plate of food. Uh, it kills me uh, to see families when they're out eating and everybody is you know, eating like this. And not only does that kill great communication, but it also doesn't allow the food to speak. And food needs to be consumed and, and allowed to do its thing. And when we don't have that time, I think that we're really being very wasteful, actually, and not respecting the process. So when I look out in school cafeterias and there, there is a certain amount of frenzy anyway because, you know, kids are kids. Um, but what I see in some instances is a hurry up and eat and go out and play. And so another initiative that would serve us well would be to have recess first so that they're played out and then they're ready to nourish themselves back to the classroom so that they can succeed academically. And we know now that, uh, you know, there is a complete um, connection between a well-nourished body and their ability to learn. And when we're saying hurry up, finish, that's contraindicated. And we can't keep doing that. We need to somehow establish a better meal time. Something that we've talked about today is folks recognizing you for your leadership. Woman of the Year we talked about and you know you're, you're everywhere Nancy. Mm -hmm. You're doing so many great things and we're not the only ones recognizing that. I understand <laughs> that that the, the district and yourself received a national recognition. Can right. you tell us about that national <laughs> recognition? So that was the Golden Carrot Award. Um, we were honored a couple years ago um, by the Physicians Committee on Responsible Medicine and Neil Barnard, who is a, a pioneer in um, plant-based uh, cuisine and how essential it is uh, to the environment and to our future uh, if only we turned more to plant-based food. And our 
commitment started long ago in, when I started writing our menus back in 2008. Um, I, I was definitely already back then including vegetarian entrees. They didn't go over very well and it was really upsetting but it didn't back me down from continuing to serve vegetarian entrees mm -hmm. and we're lucky enough now to have um, been introduced to a product called Hungry Planet and uh, it is a plant-based, 100% pure plant-based protein that mimics meat and they've got fl different flavor profiles including beef and chicken and sausage and at Earth Day we took our mobile cafe and rolled out this new plant-based product and it was remarkable the enthusiasm uh, from our um, from the consumer end was thumbs up all the way and yesterday was the first day in Santa Barbara Unified that we rolled out our Hungry Planet burger, which um, does have cheese on it, so actually it's a Hungry Planet cheeseburger. <laughs> I wasn't ready to take that cheese off and just have them look at something that, although it mimics beef, it, you know, you can tell it is not beef, uh, but it is so much better for our bodies and the universe that uh, there's no way we're not going to be continuing to serve this product. Kids did enjoy it. There were some that didn't. But there's some kids that, that don't like pizza, mm -hmm. you know. It doesn't mean we're not going to continue uh, our work. And so when I was honored with the Golden Carrot Award, um, it was really a wonderful, another wonderful point of recognition that I was on the right path. And uh, it gave me a lot of energy to keep moving in that direction. And that's why we'll be able to see that product more and more. And uh, hopefully with more education, children, their teachers, their parents will understand that we cannot sustain what we're doing in terms of big uh, farm agriculture and all of the, the, um, the emissions that are happening from cows crammed in confined feeding lots. And there needs to be a, a, a solution and one solution is to turn toward plants and, and that's a pretty vital solution and one that we're going to continue with. Well, Nancy, I can't tell you how, first of all, how quickly our time flew by today. You're an inspiration, motivation, true leader. We're so fortunate to have you nourishing our students in Santa Barbara Unified and, and actually having such an impact throughout the county and obviously nationally with that, <laughs> with that award as well. Um, so fortunate to have you and know you and have you be part of our community here. Um, thank you, Nancy, for joining me thank today. Thank you, Susan, for having me. Appreciate it's an it. honor. For me, too. I'm Susan Salcido, Santa Barbara County Superintendent of Schools. Thank you so much for joining us today for this edition of Education Matters.